So I'm going to go ahead and get started to honor everyone's time and because I know that these sessions will be recorded. So you can always go back and see what you missed if you join late. I am really grateful and happy to be here with three really accomplished journalists whose work I admire so much. My name is Catherine Reynolds Lewis. I am a longtime independent journalist based in the Washington DC area who's written for The Atlantic, Mother Jones, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and more. I'm the author of The Good News About Bad Behavior, Why Kids Are Less Disciplined Than Ever and What to Do About It. And I'm the founder of the Institute for Independent Journalists whose mission is the emotional and financial sustainability of freelancers of color. I am a longtime fan and friend of ASJ, and I'm so glad to be here with you and see some of the familiar names in the audience. Um, I want to start just by, uh, you know, acknowledging that whenever we start a conversation like this, we're actually building on the work of so many people who came before us. Um, two, two, three of whom are in this room, but um, but many generations of journalists and thinkers and um, and uh, scholars and just want to acknowledge that we're picking up where um, those conversations have been going along. I'll start by just quickly introducing our panel and then just jump right into the conversation. Sandia Dirks is a national correspondent at NPR covering race and identity. She was the host of the fabulous podcast American Suburb and is a producer and reporter on the podcast On Our Watch. And she believes all stories are stories about power. We'll be sharing her power edit document later in the session. Dr. Chenjirai Kumanika is a scholar, producer, and advocate who works in NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Alongside his re research, teaching, and service, he specializes in using narrative nonfiction audio journalism to critique the ideology of American historical myths about issues such as race, the Civil War, and policing. He is co-creator, co-executive producer, and co-host of Uncivil, Gimlet Media's fabulous podcast on the Civil War, and he is the collaborator and co-host for Seen on Radio's Influential Season 2, Seeing White, and Season 4 on the History of American D Democracy. Last but definitely not least, Erica Hayasaki is a colleague and friend, part of the leadership of the IIJ with me. Her work appears in the New York Times Magazine, Wired, Atlantic, so many others that I also want to write for someday. Her fellowships include the Knight Wallace and Alicia Patterson, a former national correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. She's a professor at the University of California, Irvine's literary journalism program, and she's the author of The Death Class, The Death Class, and more recently, Somewhere Sisters, which is a really fabulous nonfiction story about uh, transnational, transracial adoption and family and all of the complications, highly recommend, and race and identity, all the things we're going to be talking about today. So to start, um, I'll just jump right in and uh, count on the speakers to, to say something or raise a hand if you want to uh, speak. This is a panel on power and storytelling, and I want to start by asking each of you first how you think about power dynamics in reporting, in stories, and in media overall. And if you can, we can begin with any ideas or frameworks that really help us begin to navigate power. I'm I not going Sandy. first. Yeah, so I'm not appointed to someone. <laughs> the first if you're a man, don't go first. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call on Sonia then. Um, well, one of the reasons I pointed at Chandra is because um, a lot of my thinking about uh, power was shaped in a, in conversation with him um, uh, as we began to articulate um, how to think about power. And it, it is something that, that I've always thought about in terms of, um, you know, look, the basic underlying tenant of journalism is you hold power to account, right? That's kind of what we do when 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 we do investigative journalism. So any journalist is going to say, all right, we hold power to account. That's what we do. You know, the other great kind of adage that I go back to again and again is, is you know, um, comfort uh, the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, which is the same kind of motivation behind it, right? So, you know, that fundamentally we understand, all right, we are holding power to account. Unfortunately, in practice, that's often not how journalism works. Power is actually, as as you know, as, as I've studied, as I've been a journalist, 
I've realized that there's this deep power bias within the work that we do. And, you know, I think in, in some ways it's just built into the system, right? You know, you know, for example, I take any kind of reporting on police. We'll tend to, you know, share a police account of a situation, right? As we learn and learn more about what police accounts are and how they have been manipulated to actually mask the truth, we've learned, oh, that actually isn't an authoritative an account, account just because it's coming from an authority. So we need to question those in power who are often controlling narratives. And we've been taught, okay, you know, that, that's the way we go. This person has power, therefore we should talk to them. But I've began to trouble those concepts it, with Chenjerai, with other people who are doing this work, to trouble the concept that those in power somehow deserve more voice in the story. Um, and to actually kind of examine the way journalism has long given those in power more voice, to control the narrative, to, to uh, be able to speak to the narrative. How do we actually undo that? Because it's done a lot of damage. And you know, as a race and identity journalist, I, I race and equity journalist, I am, am often reporting on people of color, historically marginalized people. But what I'm really reporting on is systems of power. And that's something that I, I can't ever shake. Um, I also think that it's key right now for us to understand the way in which power is being disguised increasingly uh, in language, in slipperiness. Um, and so that we must take an honest and investigative approach to who has power in the stories we tell and who we're giving power to as well. Okay, now I'm gonna give Sandhya her wish and ask Chenjerai to share some thoughts. Um, yeah, San Sanja put it so briefly, and I just wanna say I'm really thankful to be here. I wanna thank everybody that took time to create this space and those who are making time to attend because we need spaces like this so much of what we need we do need when it comes to this is just the time and space that's part of what uh these systems crowd out for us and then you know they put us into like an urgent where you gotta make frantic decisions and then you can't make transformative and radical decisions so and i also want to just lift up that the people i'm in this talk with their work is so powerful i mean a, a big part of my answer to the question is that this this in addition you know these these questions operate on multiple levels right they have there's the content there's also the kinds of platforms and institutions we're involved with are places to be thinking about and as freelance folks you know you're often entering into an institution that you may not have full leverage over but you still i think it's important to own and think about what the power dynamics are there's the process which is different than the platforms right it's like what are we making in addition to the story because we're making relationships we're making you know a process can leave a mark on you a process also can choose to involve impacted people in certain ways or not you know so the process is important and i think that the um and then finally i would say you know that last p like that participation part is important what comes becomes after the story Are our stories just add real estates or metrics for a publisher book publisher you know and I think that the people on this platform, your work is such a wonderful way of weaving those things together. I mean, I look at, you know, Erica's work and how she's able to take some of these stories about family or a story about somebody teaching a class about death and then really through that impact all these layers, right? She's not just looking at the personal, even though we're welcomed in through a really intimate, exciting, compelling story that we can identify with, but then she sort of transforms us by showing us what this also means about our society. Similarly, Catherine's work is doing the same thing with discipline. I'm raising a four-year-old now, so I'm like, oh man, I'm, I'm eager for that concrete advice. But in fact, right, the book is not actually even just about our kids. It's about what, you know, how, what, what this world has taught us about how discipline works and what we get wrong. So I just think y'all, I hope, I think everybody, in the, if you're at this thing, hopefully you already know this way. And Sonia, don't let me to forget Sonia. Sonia's work, before she met me, come on. She, Sonia's very generous. But American suburb, man, come on. I'm a student still now of that storytelling. And of course, on our watch. So I hope everybody attends to the great examples that are here of weaving those levels together. Oh, that's very kind. I, I and and good lead in to ask Erica to to share like when your work now. How are you thinking about navigating power, or you know, what are the dynamics as you go about your reporting? Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm really honored to be on this panel with all of you who have deeply inspired my work and actually given me um, a framework and a kind of a language to help articulate some of the things that I've been teaching within you know, my classrooms and doing within my own work over the years. So I just wanna say that I'm very honored to be on this panel. And um, you know, in terms of the work, I, I appreciate you mentioning kind of the different layers of storytelling because I think about um, 
those layers a lot. I think about uh, narrative storytelling a lot. And, um, you know, the way that I kind of was brought up in journalism many years ago, um, it was a very traditional way of learning the field uh, and the craft and the work. Um, it was, you know, door knocking after tragedies, showing up on doorsteps in somebody's worst moment and being expected to get quotes. Um, it was this idea that the journalist is sort of always right, you know, and not giving agency to the people in the stories. It was often like driven by news coverage or, um, you know, editor ideas and, you know, the, the transparency was not always there for um, how we're doing this work, how we're in part of the community sometimes that we're reporting on. Um, you know, there have been, you know, historically ideas that people who are of the community have a bias, right? And so um, can't be covering it in a fair way. Um, so I think about, and also parachute journalism, which is a whole conversation that we have all the time in my classes or avoiding even something like first person, putting yourself into the narrative at all, even if you are deeply connected to the stories um, and also acknowledging like your own positionality when you're an outsider in um, going into a situation where you're you, you're not necessarily of the community. How do you tell those stories in a responsible, transparent way? That's not, as Sandia would say, uh, has said in other panels, extractive. Um, and so I, there's a quote that I, I take from a writer from this book called Craft in the Real World. Um, he's a, a, a professor who teaches, um, you know, creative writing, Matt Salassi's, Salassi's, I think, I'm not sure I'm saying his last name right, but he says, craft like the self is made by culture and reflects culture and can develop to resist and reshape culture if it is sufficiently examined and enough work is done to unmake expectations and replace them with new ones. And um, like I said, th these conversations are happening in the world of fiction and, and other creative genres, but it, it needs to happen more in our classrooms. We need to, especially when we're talking about journalism and in our newsrooms and our media organizations and a lot of the work that I'm even doing personally um, you know, in the last decade has been unlearning these approaches that um, center power sometimes or, or come at it from a perspective where power is given a bigger voice um, and the people who have less power, less voice. So I appreciate um, the conversations that we have because we're thinking about how to examine our stories and our biases um, while we're reporting and doing them. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's 10 different directions we could we could go after this conversation, but I'm wondering if maybe we could talk, you know, on this notion of extractive, which also Chandra I put in the chat, you know, being a storyteller versus a story taker. Um, <clears throat> I remember one ASJA conference, I, when I was first learning to do long form nar narrative, you know, I started off in daily journalism and I didn't, I'm, I was like, how do I even begin to learn this? And I sort of self-taught and at the panel, one of the speakers said, well, you know, for example, you know, fly to South America, embed yourself with, you know, re resistance fighters, and then you have a great story. And now I think looking back, some of those pieces of advice or the sort of how do you get a pitch accepted or how do you, you know, start doing this kind of work, um, we do have to unlearn. Um, and yet often we are going into communities and that aren't our own. I mean, the sort of as a journalist in some ways, we're always that outsider. So. Um, how are you each seeing these conversations in journalism about non-extractive reporting, um, changing some of our practices? Um, and do you have any suggestions for, you know, the process, right? Giving more agency, you know, participation, um, you know, being being transparent about what's going to happen next and and other sort of rules that we, we can break. Um, reading sections of stories back or giving time, you know, sometimes, which as, as Chandra I said, is often so scarce. Um, I don't know, maybe start with you, Chandra I, about sort of ideas or suggestions for folks about breaking some of those rules we learned or, or other ways to be less extractive or, or not take stories from the folks we're interviewing, right. reporting on. Yeah, I mean, it's such a great point, and and I'm and I'm already learning so much from this panel. I think that um, you know, there's a number of different sort of strategies and alternative ways of thinking that we that we want to make alternative that we want to make the hegemonic ways. We want to make that the main way of doing reporting. But I think it's important that it starts 
from the very beginning, because often what happens is, you know, maybe all of us have had the experience of being interviewed and where, where you could tell that the journalist, and I'm, and I'm being compassionate to the situation the journalist is in, where they've kind of already figured out what's going to happen and they just need you to say X, Y, and Z. And so there's not really an opportunity for you to shape. And so that has particular kinds of consequences or contribute in certain ways. And that has consequences when you're talking about issues of power. It, it closes the space for trauma-informed journalism, right? Where, you know, you know, you want often our reporting is going to be talking about really serious uh, topics, giving the interviewer, the person who's being interviewed, the power to, to go, not interviewing with your questions to ask the hard questions we we're talking about, but actually let them have some power to unfold the story because again, you're making something other than the story when you make it. So there's that, there's, I think, you know, different ways of involving communities, including them and thinking about what their needs are um, when you be, you know, and sort of really including folks in the process, certainly following up. But one really important point I want to make, one of the biggest myths that these sort of empire, I call these things, my way of sort of wrestling with what people want to call anti-racism or patriarchy, all the thing is that we're still, as far as I'm concerned, dealing with empire politics, right, that have all those dimensions to it, right? And those empire politics, one of the biggest myths that they create is that the powerful, they work collectively together on boards as organizations. And then us, whether even when we're in a news organization or whether we're freelancers, we then have to confront those powers often as individuals. So one of the great things about an organization like this is what we're really fighting for when we talk about extractive conditions, you're talking about working conditions is what you're fighting for. Because we can all have the ideas <laughs> about what we want to do, but the question is, are you going to have those conditions for an organization? And when I look at organizations where we've started out a conversation about a story or an interview process or an editing session with those questions that will make it non-extractive, those conversations that happen at any journalist places, I've, at journalist institution I've been in, and I've been at many, which is encouraging, but that was the result of struggle that people fought for collectively to say, we have to change it, in which people who were in power didn't like it. And in which often, the last piece I'll make is that um, if you are someone who says, I think the way we're approaching this story is a little extractive. I think we're not attending to a particular dimension of power, whether it's gender, whether it's patriarchy, whether it's you know what a privileged class, whatever. Oftentimes, the pushback will come to you in the form of what will be called professionalism. And that's what makes it so hard to fight back against, right? The people who are fighting back are like, oh, how dare you say, indicate that I'm not, I'm not about that. I'm what I'm trying to do is be professional. Or the the way that we're doing this is about being professional. So empire hides in professionalism. And the way that we can really best fight that is to collectively work for conditions with each other. And I just want to make that, that point that it's it's not just about our individual inclinations, but what kind of leverage we can exact over that process. I think that's absolutely right. Like one of the one of the things that I that I have said is um like, you know, there's this thing in radio where a lot of people used to say like listening is an act of love, right? Like that, you know, that, like this is a big public radio trope. Like when you listen to someone, it's an act of love. And and like my big thing was actually, actually no, listening as a journalist is an act of power, right? Because you're taking somebody's story. There's kind of no way to make what we do not extractive. We are extracting someone's story. We are putting it in a framework that is different than the full lived experience of their complex nuanced life because we're using it for something else so like that's icky it's always going to be icky let's just start with that and accept that and acknowledge that and then we're going to find ways to acknowledge and, and and work against that right against because storytelling is also important and I think you know there's a difference between interviewing uh, a powerful politician when you want to like grill them and hold them accountable there's a difference between you know interviewing somebody um, in a position of power in a system of power and interviewing somebody who has no power so I think the first thing that we need to acknowledge is is what the power dynamics are and that includes our own power dynamics and and for freelancing that's going to be a, like even more complex right because you're understanding what your power is trying to pitch a story to an organization that you need to accept the story so you need to play by their rules but also you want to do the right thing. like there are so many layers to this and to keep it all straight is a lot but when we're in a room interviewing someone, right, and asking for them to tell us the precious details of their lives so we can use those in a narrative, we have the power. And that never needs to be like, that has to be always top of one's mind. Um, and so 
one of the ways I think that we work towards less extractive journalism is being just really conscious about what about the fact that we are extracting. And part of that is, you know, as you know, Chandra was talking about trauma informed reporting, DART Center has great resources on this. For those that haven't kind of looked at those, I highly suggest they're free, they're out there, they can help you deal with people who are in trauma, but people don't even have to be in trauma to be in trauma. You know, you don't have to be interviewing somebody about a lost loved one, an illness, for them to be feeling that trauma of systemic oppression. So I think like every interview we do with someone who doesn't have the systemic power of being in a position of power, we should be bringing trauma informed reporting to bear for that precise reason, because trauma is impacting people, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, those are impacting people. And those are all traumatic systems that we all live and exist within. Um, so part of what what I, I I I try to do when I'm talking to people is is to be as transparent as possible, right? Like you know, they're to try to say this is how I'm going to use this. This is what's going to go forward. Um, the great Sam Sanders once said, "Breaking news breaks um, news," which it does. When you are doing breaking news, it is really hard to do this. When we have the luxury of working a little bit longer, you can give a little bit more of yourself. And I always suggest and always feel that like giving part of myself back when someone's sharing something with me is key. Um, we can't make this equal because we are taking someone's story, but we can work deeply to 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 earn trust. Um, and so I think just being aware of power dynamics is one of the, the deep ways in which we defy the normalization of extraction as acceptable, even though that is the basis of the work that we do. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I love the idea of going in to the very interviews, the very story, the very pitching process, and immediately thinking about those power dynamics. I mean, traditionally, when so we all talk about narrative storytelling here. Or we practice narrative storytelling, whether it's audio or in uh, long form. And the way that I you know, came to understand it in the beginning was you have a sympathetic character, right? And we call them characters, which is already not uh, you know, a problematic. Um, and that character encounters an obstacle. And this is again, in nonfiction storytelling, right? Um, or uh, overcomes this obstacle somehow, um, you know, there's a climax, there's a sort of ending that feels satisfying, and that's the sort of stories that are um, popular in narrative storytelling. But if you take that structure and apply it to, for example, adoption narratives, which is, you know, what I have done in the past thinking about how to tell a story around adoption, um, traditionally thinking about systems, and you might not go into it knowing all of the systems and all of the histories that you need to know when you're beginning a project, but um, adoption is a system, science is a system. Um, and traditionally, like stories of adoption have centered adoptive parents, right? And, and, and adoption has been framed as a fairy tale. So it fits that arc of like the, you know, adoptive parent rescuing a child in need, and then it sort of ends the at the moment of adoption and everybody lives happily ever after. When in reality, if you center the stories of the adoptees who have had a lot less power in the storytelling and a lot less kind of centering in the narrative um, in traditional Hollywood and, and media, um, you know, the reality is much more complex, painful. It doesn't allow that story arc does not allow always for the for the reality of the complications and experiences and feelings of powerlessness in that experience, right? So a lot of what I talk about is thinking about how to complicate that structure when you're when you're telling a story. So it doesn't necessarily have to fit that arc that you think everybody wants, right? Um, it can begin in a place that's unexpected. It can braid in other voices, and it can braid in even if you're centering a family, the voices of activists who don't necessarily directly know the, the family or scholars who are also adoptees or you know people within the community. And we think about experts like again unlearning what you've been taught experts come with a phd right they have a professor like title or they've been studying some you know area for their whole life but experts are also the people who have the lived experience and so how much can you center those voices and so sometimes these structures they do become more complicated they do become maybe the kind of structures that hollywood's not necessarily seeking out for their next movie but um it is the kind of storytelling that's real and I think can capture some of that nuance, that complexity, that pain, and those power dynamics that are skewed, 
right? And um, that's that's an important sort of layer, I think, to the to the discussion of how to talk about it. And then, of course, you know, we can talk about how to bring the people into the story that you're writing about or that you're covering. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that, like, sort of techniques that um, I'm often thinking about practicing and going over with students too about um, giving them more agency in the storytelling. I, I wanted to underline something that Erica said that I think is so key, which is that if if you're applying any of this analysis of power to the work that you're doing, what you're doing is realizing that what you're reporting on is systems. Even when you're reporting on people, what you're really reporting on is systems. And so it's finding the system on, in your story and fit system, because there's going to be more than one, and figuring out who has the power in those systems. And that is key to the background work that one has to do. Like, you know, and you know, you might not know all of those things, but every system that we face in American life, whether it's adoption, whether it's the legal system, whether it's the police system, whether it's the education system, all of these systems are going to be central in your story. They're main characters. We have to treat them as such. And they have a history. And that history is deeply imperative in how they act. They don't act the way necessarily they say they're acting. They act the way that history will tell you they're acting. And so learning those histories is as key as learning the history of the main character in your story. Thank you so much. I, I love that idea of <clears throat> the system, uncovering the system and having that be a rich and living character because of course that that character is shaping so much of what happens and the more we make it visible the more honest our stories will be um and i'd love to also talk a little bit more practically about some of those rules that we should be breaking you know i now <clears throat> routinely you know i read back sections of the story i give a lot of time for my um subjects, try not to say characters anymore, um, to really think about, you know, what impact this piece will have on them and their life and their people that they know, um, especially when reporting on children. Um, and I, I know some folks I've talked with in this area say, well, you know, I've, I'm giving compensation or I'm paying, paying, donating money or giving compensation. That's another rule that sort of we've always heard is like never pay your sources. Um, but are there ways that we can make some kind of compensation or amends or whatever it is for the taking, the story taking that we're doing? I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on some of the rules we should start thinking about breaking and how to do that thoughtfully. Chandrai, do you wanna start? Well, I raised this issue, but I'm actually curious to hear how other folks navigate that because I feel like we're in a moment where that, that assumption that, you know, compensating people in any way compromises one's journalistic integrity um is i've seen some people question that especially in in the light of the fact that you know uh people give us their stories and then folks go and get book deals and all kinds of other things um that and usually and often those impacted folks are not along for that ride so i'm just curious to hear how you all have navigated that you know um or think about it. I'm happy to jump in with something a colleague shared with me um, in the context of reporting in indigenous communities, where it is part of their culture that you bring gifts right and you, and sometimes that is a gift card and that and it's you know and and to sit down with someone and you know hear their story, you would not be welcome into that home without coming with some kind of gift and that made a lot of sense to me in that context. Um, that was that journalist practice, but I have Sandy or Erica, what are your thoughts? I have not yet done that. And to me, it, I feel not even so much that it violates my integrity as a journalist, but is that such a simple transaction? Like I'm taking your story and so I'm paying you? Like it don't, my responsibility does not end there. It does not somehow, because I wrote this check, then I don't have to take care and I don't have to follow up and be in community with you for the long haul. Right, so that's where I'm kind of stuck. Yeah, I'm certainly, I can jump in. I mean, I've certainly thought about this a lot. And, um, you know, I've been in conversation with journalists or students who are doing work and myself around the idea of gift cards. And I think as even as a research, like when people reach out to you as researchers, right, academic researchers, that seems to be a standard, pro um, standard sort of practice now, offering gift cards to feel you know, participate in this survey. Um, and I, I think, uh, I, th I just think that's an interesting conversation. Also, um, there's a, uh, one of my 
colleagues talked about um, a journalist who did a sort of story which did involve parachuting into a community and um, you know it was a deeply reported story but also gave a byline to somebody in uh, the story that was also you know part of the story which is really interesting um, when I think about this just with stories that I've done and book projects um, and this is not something that is necessarily new to me because I have especially with the stories where I know people have been traumatized, where they are not in positions of power, where they're just regular folks who've agreed to share their lives uh, to the world. Um, I have routinely, and this goes back many years, read back their work to them, sat down, cried through it with them. That is like, <laughs> it's not it's not actually such a foreign concept to me because it sort of came naturally, but I certainly know journalists who've said, I'll never do that, you never share your work, da da da. Um, that was a practice that I did with my last book. You know, the people um, who were in it knew what they said and we had gone over everything that was in their stories and also talked about whether they're comfortable. And they, I took parts out that were not comfortable, right? And I just think that that's, um, I don't know, I just think that that's being a good human in some cases. Uh, but, you know, we go back to these conversations in ethics all the time about, journalists who've sort of been there and not intervened in certain moments. And these are all ethical discussions that we can have all the time. Um, another thing that I did uh, in reporting about, again, a community where I have overlapping experiences with the people that I wrote about, um, and but I am not an adoptee. So again, acknowledging your positionality, which is sort of this term that comes out of like social sciences, but whether that's acknowledging a statement in the beginning of not, not being an adoptee, but here's where I'm coming from, here's what my potential biases might be, here's what how I did this project, being transparent or just writing that out for yourself. Um, you know, I put I had a panel of readers who were, you know, um, like six or seven people, all writers or you know, journals of some kind or academics, mostly adoptees, transnational adoptees who read over early versions of the manuscript and like gave real honest, brutal feedback, which I found to be incredibly helpful. I guess in the fiction world, you might call it like a sensitivity read, but this was more like a discussion-based sort of workshop where um, we had, you know, conversations about when are you centering whiteness, right? And that was a real conversation because the story um, skipped around to different perspectives and then the historical take, which I think about a lot. And then of course, after the fact, also having people who are, of the community, adoptees, in my case from Vietnam, same age group um, who are sort of these independent readers who can come in and really give me this honest feedback who are paid, right? And that's a that's a challenge because then you have to find the way to pay that through grants or however that might be. Um, but I think those are just a couple of things. I mean, there's a lot of other sort of craft techniques that we can continue to talk about and that we do um, in how to compensate, how to make people in the story feel like they're a part of it and not being just their story taken from them. I, you know, come from a pretty traditional journal, like I work for traditional journalist organizations which have rules around this, right? Like, so you don't pay people and there are reasons for that, right? Um, and and especially as like, we see who asks for money for stories, um, like those aren't actually the people who maybe need the money, interestingly enough. Uh, those are often people who are grifting on their narrative, right? Um, and so like, you know, when that comes up, that there's also, you know, weird flags on the other edge. I find it, uh, there, there are a cobbled together set of ethics around journalism, which I find hilarious because unlike medicine, unlike the law, there's no professional standards for journalists. Like, you know, you, you're a journalist. You don't necessarily have to go to a journalism school. You don't need to get a certificate. You're a journalist because you say you're a journalist, right? And so this idea that there's this ethical standard, like it's murky, right? It is crazy murky, which means we're kind of on our own. Like, yes, SBJ has a, you know, an ethics that you can read through. Um, and there are some problems in what SBJ says. And they have been actually kind of working through some of these problems because these are, again, you know, journalism is a system just like any of these other systems. And it was set up to support white supremacy, to support the patriarchy. It was set up to defend and be biased on the side of the status quo, which means that it would negate anything that threatened the status quo, right? Like all of these, like, you know, so, so like, 
ethics is murky. It's still being written, which means that you need to be constantly be engaged in these conversations. There are sometimes no set rules. And sometimes the set rules are determined by the context that you are in. Um, and I think that particularly when you're talking about um, people who, you know, there are a lot of writers and uh, reporters who have made a lot of, who've made their careers off of, let's, for example, take violence in Chicago. Right. You know, there are there are people who have written um, continuously about this and have done very well for themselves. There are people who have, you know, made documentaries about this and, and have done very well for themselves. I think at a certain point, if you're making your living off of somebody else's life, then you need to think about what compensation for that means. Um, and I think that that is, is as, as you get into to, to places where you're talking book deals, as you're talking, you know, television shows, Netflix, that's when I think that becomes like even more of a, like a poignant discussion, because that's the moment where you're talking about, I'm taking money for this. I'm getting paid for somebody else's story. Um, and so I think that there are, we, just, we, we need to constantly be involved and engaged in these conversations. I think this does particularly come up in indigenous um, cultures. And I encourage people to, I, I believe Connie Walker has spoken about this um, in various places. And I encourage people to find Connie Walker who um, was behind the podcast, uh, Stolen Surviving St. Saint, Saint Michael's and um, a couple of uh, Finding Cleo. Um, and who has some really powerful things to say about, you know, there are times when you break those rules because you're not actually in playing by those rules because you're in a different, you're in some entirely different culture and you need to be of that culture. Yeah, I mean, I would, I thank you for, for sharing. I, again, this is instructive. And the only thing I would really add is that, um, you know, it's interesting. I taught uh, intro to journalism at NYU this spring. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, we thought we, we looked very closely at the different and emerging ways in which journalists are deprived of our, of our autonomy. And I think in this in this environment, it is really important to think about how the different ways your autonomy might be attacked, including people offering, you know, there's all kinds of ways. Right. Um, but I, I like just listening to everything that's been said. I mean, I think that there's a spectrum of ways. I don't know if maybe compensation is the wrong word, even because the way it sounds very like transactional. But I definitely try to think about, I mean, I feel, first of all, let me just say, I don't, I'm not like on a, on a, in some kind of, like, I feel like a lot of times I've probably failed to, to achieve the vision here in, in, in some of my work. Cause a lot of people have given me their stories or contributed stories to stuff I've worked on. And I don't know that I could say that they've benefited, you know, so I have to just own that. But at the same time, I mean, in certain, in the, in the ways that they possibly could, but I will say that there's a lot of different whole spectrum of ways to think about what our obligations are. And I think that the dominant framework in, in, in our country and in standard journalism is that we don't owe anything to anybody. And so I think that's that orientation is one of the big things that has to shift. Once that orientation shifts, what I found interestingly is of all the stories I've told and I've, you know, just folks who have, you know, like not, I haven't really had a situation where people are demanding money a lot. Sometimes people want time Sometimes we might be positioned in a way to help them in a variety of ways. I mean, I think ultimately what people sometimes want is to feel like they're still in community. And if you're a working journalist who's cranking out like, you know, a stories a day, I get that that's a very hard demand to meet. Like I can't be in community with every single body, thousands of people, but you'd be surprised on what you can do. And, and um, you know, credit is part of it. I've definitely made people co-researchers on a project just because I'm like, if I'm being real, you know, then why not, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? That credit time people need you know all kinds of things recommendation letters references they're trying to help you know it's situations in their life so i think once we shift out of the idea that we don't owe any owe anybody anything you know there's a variety of ways that we can try to uh weigh in on that and so thank you for you know um sharing you know how y'all are thinking through it i would i would i wonder if i could just add one thing i mean one part of trauma-informed reporting is also um you know, asking the people that you're interviewing, why, why do they want to tell, like, what are they hoping to get out of this? What do they want? Why do they want to tell their story? And what are they hoping is sort of the best case scenario and being public about whatever their story might be? And so that's an important kind of question that, again, if we're coming at it as like the journalist is always just, we're just here to tell a story. That's our job. It's the right thing. You know, we're, we're telling it because we're, you know, challenging power or whatever that might be, you're not necessarily thinking about the people and why they want to tell the stories and then engaging them in like that process, hearing those parts of their stories 
Um, and also just in terms of like after stories come out, like I've also, you know, worked for places and have, you know, freelance for places that absolutely you're not paying people for your story, for their stories. But there is something about af after the fact when the story is done and there can be opportunities and there are, you know, and people do come along and want to, you know, option a story or something like that. And very often those people might try to cut out actually the very people that have told you their story and just sort of option your story. And then you're, you know, and I have fought in those cases to have the people part of that, even if nothing has come of it, you know, so that that is part of like a possible compensation after the fact where, you know, I've done the reporting, there isn't, it's not going to like influence me in some way. Um, but that's just a, a small note on compensation. Yeah, this uh, super helpful conversation. And I think I really take the point that time and being in community and following up, you know, staying in community, that is really part of our obligation. And, you know, as a independent journalist and at the Institute for Independent Journalism, we always talk about, you know, some gigs you can take and some gigs you can't. And so build that into your time as a freelancer, like to really do the story in my own responsible way, you know, the way that I feel is ethical, I would need to have an extra 10 hours, you know, or whatever, like to, to follow up and say, what did you think of the piece? Did you get any blowback? Is there anything I can do now? Right? Are there things that are happening to you after this has come out? Right? And, and you know, continue to be in conversation and it doesn't end with publication. Um, I want to make sure we talk about Sandia's um, Google Doc, which is so helpful, but I also want to encourage folks, there's some good comments in the chat. Can you also put any questions in the Q&A and I will take them in a couple minutes. Um, and the person who put the question in about compensation, do you still have a question or do you think we've adequately addressed it? Um, so Sonia, can you talk us through sort of your power edit document and what are some of the questions you know, we should be thinking of or the ways we should go into, you know, sort of the pre-reporting or framing the story that help us to be more conscious of all of the things that we've all been talking about? So for the most part, this document is just a guide to do what we've been talking about, right? Like it's 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 just like, what I threw down to keep these things front of mind. And one of the ways that um, I've, I've heard it discussed is, you know, that like we know about, about doing a fact check on a story. Like these are things you do, right? Like you fact check a story because you, you don't want things to be wrong on it. Like, or if you are working an investigative story, you might have done a legal check where you have the lawyers look at it and they've got to go through and make sure these di different things are happening. Um, and those are really important because they're important to be for accuracy. They're important to make sure that you're saying things right. But what if we also did that with power, right? What if we did a version of a fact check, a version of a legal check with power. And we did something that was sort of a power narrative edit to understand how power was working in our story and to check it so that we weren't just sending it out the door without being aware of these things. And what that means is thinking about them beforehand. So this document that I put together was really just a way to try to formula, to try to uh, create a, a formalized way to examine the power narratives in our stories. Um, and it's just a series of questions. That's all it is. Um, a series of questions you should ask before you start, a series of questions you should ask while you are doing the story, and a series of questions you should ask at the end. And these are stories you should ask as an editor. Um, I mean, not you should, like you, if you want to, um, as an editor, as a reporter, um, as a writer. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is important when we do a story is to ask some very, you know, kind of ontological questions like, why are we covering this story? And who is it for? Those are things that sometimes we kind of assume or what, or they don't, we don't kind of probe into. But if you start examining those questions, who is this for? And, and why are we doing it? You might actually reveal things that you didn't know that either show that you have biases you didn't realize or help you understand better how to report it. Um, you know, I think that oftentimes, you know, that's, you know, because you guys are going to be working for different kinds of organizations, different organizations have presumed readership, right? So that that's going to color how that story comes out, right? And 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 how it's framed, even before you've done a piece of reporting. Um, I think that, hold on, I'm trying to kind of basically go through this. Um, I think that um, you know, as I said before, 
Finding the systems in your story is absolutely key. Uh, to understand the systems that you're reporting on is basically something that I think is essential for us to do. We know who our characters are. We must also know who our systems are. And, you know, I think that oftentimes this is something Chandra has talked about a lot, but oftentimes, you know, we we keep stories either in the realm of the individual, right? This is a story about what's something that happened to one person, or we talk about stories in the realm of the cultural. This is a story about, you know, something that happened to this one person and here's the culture they live in. But we need to go deeper to the systemic and the structural because that's really the superstructure in which we're all operating in. It's one of the reasons I hate the term culture war um, and refuse to use it because I think culture war reduces what is really a systemic war on marginalized marginalized people and makes it seem like it's a cultural decision about, I don't know, what color shirt you're going to wear. And so I think continuously understanding our the systems as characters, as well as figuring out who has the power in your story and acknowledging your own power as a reporter who has the ability to craft and narrate those, those stories are just key things to be aware of at all times in the process. So I literally made this document just to have a series of questions for myself or for others that might help you understand how power is working. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I, it reminds me of when I first started r- reminding myself to ask for pronouns when I was interviewing folks, I just had a post it on my, on my desktop. Cause I'm like, I will forget. This is a new practice. I'm doing something different now. Um, I don't know if, um, uh, interesting qu- point Chandra, I put in the, the, um, chat about the presumed audience is often used as a weapon against radical storytelling because that presumed audience is often right white middle class you know people like our editors right most of our editors and um and it's so interesting when you think about reframing a nut graph you know who is the audience thinking about who is the audience that's super helpful to me um erica i want to ask you i know that this idea of breaking the narrative sort of assumptions about the the, the arc of the story and who's centered, um, you know, and how you brought that to bear in structuring your, your book um, with regard, regard to, you know, centering different voices and what were some of the ramifications in real life when you go against people's expectations and folks who are used to being centered see the story being told from a different perspective? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say Sandia's document was incredibly helpful because I I had already drafted and gone through drafts of this book when I came across um, your document somehow. I don't even know where <laughs> it was shared somewhere. And again, it gave me a framework to sort of, again, go through and edit and check myself and check these different, check off these questions. Because um, I have, you know, I've always, I've thought about storytelling and character dimension um, social dimension and like human condition dimension, like that, that is how I've sort of traditionally taught my students of these three dimensions that go into a, like a long form, but the social dimension part of it is deeper. It is about the systems. I think like the social dimension is the questions of why are we telling the story now? What is the impact on society? All of that, um, you know, what are the social issues and that question around systems was so important because when I started to think about that research that I had already gone into the the whole book about his that goes into history understanding where we are now in the framework of history and the context and all of that right and why people have certain ideas for example around adoption and narratives embedded in their minds and uh, when you break that structure so the story of the book uh, it you know there are chapters where history is a is a character right um and there's sections where the talk around the discussion from uh, adoptees who are also working in spaces of activism or citizenship, for example, those are character chapters. Um, That did not please the the adoptive mother in my book. Um, uh, That idea of think, again, because adoption is so embedded in the culture as this sort of fairy tale narrative, which is again also um, wrapped up in like today's discussion around uh, like abortion, right? Um, ad- adoption has been framed as a way of like a, as a kind of solution to uh, the end of abortion, right? Um, just and you, know, you saw all these um, people on like Twitter saying, "I'll adopt your baby," right? And it just becomes um, ter- like these again erasing the realities of people who are adopted. 
Um, but people don't, everybody is within their own system. And some people, it's hard to see outside of their system. And so I, that was, again, I had to deal with the blowback on that. And um, I think that's also just part of being a journalist. Like that is, you're doing, that's not the first time. And it's unfortunate because the structure of the book did kind of show different perspectives and everybody was connected in this same narrative. They're all part of the same story, but they were seeing it from very different perspectives. And so, and then, and when you take in the historical and the structural chapters, then again, that's another layer of perspective. Um, and it makes it much more complicated and not always easy to read. Um, and so I think that if people are, again, seeking the kind of happy ending fairy tale, everything is wrapped up in a bow, um, that is not the reality of the story. But um, if people are turning to that kind of storytelling for that, uh, you know, when you're challenging these structures and doing it differently, um, you might get some blowback. Also just from readers, you know, who expect a certain story and get something else. You know, a lot of people say they learned so much or it was, you know, giving voice to their experiences and some people didn't understand why all the extra stuff was in there. So, you know, it's part of it. <laughs> so interesting uh, hearing you talk about this because that's in so many stories I've written, I literally have a section that's like the history of X. And, you know, it's such a common device. Who says that's the history, right? Who, who gets to determine what's gonna be in that explaining the context, right? It's very tricky. Um, and I'd love to ask, I think we have a question for maybe Tamara, one more question. Um, can you share other sort of stereotypes or tropes um, that you think folks should be aware of that you see uh, like missing the hidden power or missing the system or, or biases, especially when we're going into communities that we are not part of? And you know, how should we make those decisions about, is this my story to tell? You know, how do I do this responsibly? Um, one one word I think and this is really obvious, but one word that you should always circle with a red pen is the word "we," when that gets used. Um, it's a word that you sometimes can't avoid, avoid because you're trying to sort of identify what common assumptions might be that the readers might share, and then complicate those with our narratives, but. The we, whenever you start, whenever you say we, that's a really political moment. That's important because who is the we, right? And as we know, there is no, there is not really a we, right? <laughs> there's not, a, there's not a meaningful we in America. So, you know, and it's, and, you know, so I just think that that's just making time and space to think about that and talk about that and not seeing it as an annoyance is a thing um, that's important. Um, and uh, I think, um, you know, I mean, I this is kind of boring and sort of maybe obvious, but I, you know, I, 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 a lot of what I learned and some of the most things that have helped me the most in narrative. I'm currently working on, you know, made uncivil about the history of civil war. I'm currently studying things about the NYPD. A lot of the critical frameworks that inform my journalism, when I confronted newsrooms, they were like, "Oh, those are big ideas, right?" And it kind of speaks to the point that Sonia was making about understanding systems, right? And and yet, and so, I, I, you know, to me, and I, I think, I, you know, Sonia and I shared this when we did our workshop on, on power. I'm like, I just want to be crystal clear that to study radical feminist history, to study radical queer history, if you don't know those things and you're reporting on those histories, you actually don't know the real history. It's not about perspectives, because a lot of times these things are like, well, we want to go get this community's perspective. And it's like, no, this is this is actual history. So we're so I see myself as like doing a, you know, I know objectivity is controversial. When I make uncivil, when I get ready to say this, make this podcast about the history of the NYPD that people are going to like, that's a better objective history. It ain't a perspective. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, um, and I think that it's important to, um, because the, the last piece of this, I guess, is that we've all been made by a set of assumptions. So if you don't have something to challenge those, then you're just remaking what, what made us already which is empire. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to transform that. So. <laughs> I, I, I just want to sort of piggyback, like Chandra is absolutely right. And like, you will notice that in 2020, people started talking about sy like systems, like it started to become a little mainstream, you know, and part of this was people started to say, oh, and when I say people, I don't mean a lot of, a lot of people were aware of this beforehand, but, but in a mainstream way, 
the idea of systemic racism began to kind of be pulled up, right? And so for those of us who had been talking about racism as systemic for for forever, because it is, it's not, racism is systemic. That is a fact. It's a fact like climate change is man-made. It's a fact like the earth is round. Um, it's one of those things that can be, that the data shows you all of these things. But But all of a sudden that framework then began to get adopted in a more mainstream way. This was so threatening that now there's entire forces that are operating in order to deny that racism is systemic, right? You know, all of, if you, if you look at what CRT, the kind of anti-CRT thing is, what that is, is it's about saying racism isn't systemic. This is how powerful talking about systems are. When we start to actually tell the truth, and I'm just saying the objective truth about how systems operate, you will see the entire apparatus uh, move against and to try to crush that truth. So this is why we need to do it. And, and I think we need to do it because it's, it's, it, it is how we fulfill that fundamental journalistic ob obligation, which is both to understand that things are nitty gritty, messy, nuanced, and complicated, but that there also is truth. And that truth is important to not let be buried underneath these sort of the, the systems of power that are actually trying to obscure it. Um, and there's one last thing I wanted to say, which is that somebody talked about and you know, people telling stories for their for their own because because it's important for people to tell stories that sometimes you're not extracting stories from people sometimes people are actually it, it means something to be listened to and I think that's absolutely true but um in the chat they use the term voiceless and I just wanted to say that that's a term that I try not to use because no one is voiceless they have been silenced and oftentimes they've been silenced by not having power but one of the things we can do is not see people as voiceless but instead find a way to understand that their voice is and should be listened to and is worth listening to Erica do you have any final thoughts to wrap us up Oh, I'm just, I'm just inspired. I'm like lingering on, <laughs> like. <laughs> I know I'm standing up cheerily, cheering too. Yeah, and I know. I know we started a minute late. So um, I, I'll just say, uh, Sandy or Chandra, if either of you have anything else to add, probably could go one minute long. Okay, then I'm just going to well, think. I'm excited to see all the work of that our participants and everybody creates. Please encourage to reach out. I want to, we got to be, you know, we got to support each other. You know what I'm saying? We got yeah. us. So please, I'm really excited to see what y'all making. Yes. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you so much to everyone for being here and everyone who is watching the recording to ASJ for having us and all the behind the scenes support. Especially thank you to Chenjirai, Kumanika, Sandia Dirks. Erica Hayasaki, I learned a lot. I feel inspired. Um, and I and I really do think it's conversations like these that help us remember why it's worthwhile to take the time and the thought uh, to do the kinds of things we've been talking about. So thank you all so much and have a good rest of the day.